We all know, unfortunately, there are many people named Muhammad who are not righteous people. The fact that they carry that noble, honorable name is no reflection on our Prophet wasallam. I say this, brothers and sisters, to say when someone draws some offensive picture and says that this image represents Muhammad, it doesn't represent our Prophet wasallam. It represents a figment of the artist or the filmmaker's imagination. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
is considered not by us Muslims. He is by, our, by us, those of us who are Muslims, the greatest human being to ever walk on the surface of this planet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this opinion, this, this belief that we believe to be factual is shared by many Westerners who aren't Muslims. Many Westerners, when they make a list of the greatest personalities in human history, at the top of the list is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. History has recorded the greatness of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu and why? Why does history acknowledge Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the greatest human being to ever live? Single-handedly, he changed the entire orientation of his people. When Jesus came to the world, Isa alayhi salam, peace upon him, he came to a people who were already familiar with monotheism because they were in the heartland of the Jewish people in present day Palestine. So some Jews believed he was the Messiah. He said, think not, as recorded in the Bible, think not that I have come but to the lost sheep of Israel. Some Jews rejected him and some accepted him. So there are the Nazarene Christians who were Jews who accepted the prophecy of Jesus. There are the Ebionite Christians. And there are theories that propose that Waraka bin Nofay was an Ebionite Christian who accepted Jesus but they still adhered to the Jewish law. And for this reason, when some say, how did Waraka bin Nofay, who the Prophet went to Khadija radiallahu anha, brought the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Waraka to affirm that he indeed had received revelation from Almighty God. But when Imam Bukhari and others record that Waraka read the Hebrew scriptures, some people say if you are a Christian, shouldn't he have been reading Aramaic? Or shouldn't he have been reading Greek? But some propose that the Ebionite Christians uh, migrated into the Hijaz. This is a historical fact. And even some of our scholars record their, their existence there as late as 300 years after our Prophet ﷺ. And so they read the Hebrew scripture and they observed the Jewish law, but they accepted Isa السلام, as the Messiah. In any case, Isa السلام, came into the heartland of the Jewish people. So it would have been very easy for them to accept his message because there was a continuity between his message and the message of Musa alayhi salam. There was a continuity between the message of Moses and the message of Jesus. Even today, most Christians, they have the Old Testament and they have the New Testament. The New Testament being a continuation of the Old Testament. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent into a sea of idolatry. A sea of idolatry where there is no recognizable connection between the polytheism of his people 
and the monotheism that he's preaching. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In spite of that, in 23 years, he totally reoriented his people. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he made them not just into monotheists, but he instilled the seed of monotheism so deeply within their souls that they exploded out of the Arabian Peninsula and they took that message within 100 years from the Pyrenees in the West to the wild of China in the East. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This alone, this alone will merit our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the architect of one of the greatest religious, social, and cultural transformations in the history of humanity, if not the single most impressive social transformation in the history of humanity. This is not the work of a madman or lunatic. This is not the work of an imposter. And this greatness, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, doesn't stop there. Having instilled the fire of monotheism, of tawheed, into the hearts of his believers, his followers rather, they then took it to the far corners of the known world at that time and created one of the, the greatest civilization in history. Some will argue, was it the greatest in terms of its intellectual output? Was it the greatest in terms of its geographical reach? Was it the greatest in terms in, uh, along this or that or the other line? We say it is the greatest because every civilization is confined to a geographical or a racial, racial or ethnic boundary. Egyptian civilization only appeared in Egypt. Hindu civilization only appeared in India. The civilizations of the Sumerians or the Chaldeans or the Phoenicians only appeared in those geographical regions. What makes the civilization of, you, of Islam unique? It is based on knowledge. It is a knowledge-based civilization. And because it is a knowledge-based civilization, it transcends ge geography. It transcends race and ethnicity. And any people who adorn themselves and beautify themselves, and this is what Islam does to people. With Islam, then they have the opportunity to share in the civilizing project of Islam. When it came to the Arabs, you saw the flowering of an Arab Muslim Islamic civilization in the heartlands of the Muslim world but also in faraway Andalusia with the entry of Abdurrahman al dakhil into Spain the remnants of the Umayyad dynasty were revived and some of the greatest marvels such as Medina to Zahra on the end, Cordoba, it's Cordoba itself, Cordoba, and on the outskirts of Cordoba, Medina to Zahra, one of the greatest architectural wonders of the ancient world appeared. And great cities like Baghdad appeared, and Fostaf, which will become Cairo, appeared, and Dimash, Damascus, with the great Emily Masjid appeared. And then when it was passed on to the Persians, you saw the flowering of Persian civilization under Islam. And you saw the great contributions of the Persians and the cities that they built. 
and the beauty in Isfahan, and Hirat, and Khurasan, Nisabur, and all of these wonders that were not only architectural wonders, but were centers of learning and scholarship. And when it passed into the Turkish hands, and that flame of Islam that was lit from the light of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayyuhal nabi, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira, wa da'iyan illahi bi idnihi wa siradan munira. O Prophet, we sent you as a witness, and as a giver of glad tidings, and as a warner, as one who calls to Allah by His command and as a luminous light, a luminous lamp. And that lamp has lit the fire of civilization. And when it passed through the Turks, you saw the great Seljuk capitals, and then culminating in the great art and the Memnu, the Mamanika, the Turkish warrior kings, slave kings of Egypt and the great monuments of learning and culture and civilization that we can still point to to this day. And then culminating in the Ottomans, one of the longest living dynasties in human history for over 500 years. <coughs> the great capital of Istanbul, the beautiful massages, and hospitals and centers that testify not only to the greatness of the Ottomans but to the greatness of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who provided the spark and the impetus that gave rise to those warriors who turned into the architects of civilization and culture. And we can go on in that regard. Our Prophet ﷺ was a mercy to all the world. We've only sent you as a mercy to all the world. And he described himself ﷺ, I am a gifted mercy to the world a gift of mercy to the world. And how can we measure that mercy? There are many ways to measure it. But we'll measure it in a way that will dispute or dispel rather some of the clouds of darkness that have been placed over the Muhammadan legacy. And that's the mercy to those people who are not Muslim living in Muslim lands. The critic today will say that the Muslims were intolerant. They were no equal. That the Christians or the Jews were all second class citizens. And that the Sharia, it oppresses minorities. Well, when the Muslims had Sharia, the Christians and the Jews and the Hindus and the Buddhists, and the Zoroastrians, all of those people and others who live under the umbrella of Sharia had sustainability. And their communities endured decade after decade, century after century. This is a fact of history. Even in those lands where Muslims had the capability to wipe those minorities out. But it's not from the nature of Islam. And it's not from the nature of our Prophet wasallam, And it's not from the nature of the followers of Muhammad wasallam, to wipe people out. So their communities sustain themselves. In Palestine, they say that the person who's involved with this film that has sparked so much controversy is a Coptic Christian. How many Coptic Christians are in Egypt? And how did their community manage to survive all of these centuries? Because of the mercy of Muhammad.
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if these minorities are threatened today, they're not threatened because of the influence of Islamic civilization, they're threatened because of the demise of Islamic civilization and Muslims being inundated by Western neo-mystic and unartistic and hegemony ideologies putting an Islamic facade on it and then launching in narrow-minded attacks against these minorities. This is a historical fact that we should not lose sight of. So the Muslims had Sharia and the non-Muslim people had sustainability. The environment has sustainability. Now we have equality. Apparently for everyone except Muslims. In France, liberté, liberty, equality, and fraternity and brotherhood. But French Muslim, the, the person who made these despicable drawings of someone they said is Muhammad. It's free to do that, but the Muslims aren't freely free to peacefully assemble and protest under the banner of equality and liberty and fraternity. In this country, if Muslims are up in arms, which they are, they're calm and dignified. But when they protest or discuss it at work with their colleagues or with their neighbors or fellow workers or fellow students, then they're told, we're told, you know, just get over it. This is freedom of speech. We have the First Amendment in this country. But when African Americans are insulted, there are protections. When one of these radio hosts, Don Imus, on the fan, WFAN, in New York City, a couple years ago, called the women of the Rutgers University basketball team that had made it to the NCAA finals against Tennessee. A bunch of nappy-headed hoes. He was fired from the radio station because he reached the limits of freedom of speech. <laughs> when Kobe Bryant called the referee a faggot, under his breath. But someone on the sidelines heard it. And the homosexual community was up in arms. And the whole Laker organization was forced to publicly apologize and issue a PSA. But had reached the limits of freedom of speech. In a famous court case in this country it was established and affirmed, or rather, an argument in defense of uh, delineating the limits of freedom of speech that if there is no fire, you cannot call, call and yell out fire in a crowded theater. That would be an encroachment on the limits of freedom of speech. But in a crowded world, a global village, when someone does something far worse than crying fire in a crowded theater, if it's Muslims, go ahead and say it. Because the paraphrase, Judge Tony, T-A-W-N-E-Y, for those who are familiar with his ruling, and will paraphrase it, on the verge of the Civil War in this country, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a Muslim has no rights in this country that a non-Muslim is bound to respect. And some of you know the original phrasing. 
of that. But it's all right. It's all right. Because we don't need the First Amendment. We don't need the government. We don't need the UN. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala, Almighty God, tells us, Man adali wa li yalfa qad adhantuhu bil harq. Azza wa jal. Kulillah. ثُمَّ بَرْهُمْ فِي خَوْضِهِمْ يَلْعَبُونَ Proclaim Allah. Then leave them in their idle, wasteful activities. Just fully playing around. To go back, I didn't finish. So the Muslims had Sharia. And the minorities had sustainability. The environment had sustainability. Now we have equality and liberty and human rights. But we also have genocide and ecocide. <coughs> human rights, equality didn't stop the genocide in Bosnia. It didn't stop the genocide in Rwanda. The Declaration of Independence and the principles of God-given rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. It didn't give the equality to the native people of this land who are wiped out. This is the legacy of modernity. It's a legacy of hypocrisy. It's a legacy of genocide. And those who are advancing these provocations against the Muslims, they're endeavoring to continue that legacy. They want to continue the world mongery. They want to create this boogeyman they can point to. See, these people are a bunch of crazy, wild lunatics. That's why we have to bomb them. That's why we have to occupy their lands. And it's not mentioned, take their resources. Brothers and sisters, don't give them any excuse. Don't give them any pretext. Maintain your dignity. Maintain your worldview. Maintain your love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And turn off the news. I was listening to a recording by one of our great contemporary scholars, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, and he's from, the, from Great Britain. He says, what is it about Muslims that you, you log on to BBC World every morning so you can feel bad about yourself? Oh, who, who, what did they blow up today? Oh, here he comes again. Turn it off. Unplug from it. And plug into the Quran. Plug into your Arad. Plug into your Adkar. Plug into the Sirah of the Prophet Wasallam. Involve yourself in positive work that builds up your self-esteem. That gives you satisfaction and contentment in your heart. Share this message with your neighbors. Share it from a, a position of positiveness. Positive energy, a positive outlook. This is our Prophet Wasallam. Allah has undertaken His defense. He told the only people, the only community, Barni wal Lead me to deal with these big shots. Yakiduna kayda, wa yakidu kayda, fammahinil kafirina, amhilhum ruwayda. They're scheming and planning. I have a plan. Lead them. For a while. Allah will take care of His Prophet. Allah Ta'ala tells His Prophet, Allah has elevated his, his mention. This is another sign of His incomparable greatness. 
No other name is on the tongue of some human being somewhere on the face of this earth every second that this earth is in existence once his religion was established. Every second as the sun goes around and the prayer times from Fajr to Zuhr to Asr to Maghrib to Isha pass and as the Nawafil pass and as people during the times who didn't pray at the beginning of the time pray in the middle or the latter part of the time and they make their karma by saying Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah Every second of existence, someone is saying the name of Muhammad, the Lord who has elevated his remembrance, the Lord who has placed his remembrance on the tongue of a human being. Every second of this world's existence, you think he cannot defend his prophet? Do you think he cannot defend his prophet? Brothers and sisters, live a dignified life. Work to strengthen your faith. Because one of the psychological aspects of these psychological warfare tactics, I'm not saying they're emanating from the government, but this film is a psychological warfare tactic. It's designed to achieve political results. One of those results is to take away the aspect where the Republicans can't attack President Obama. This is not a commercial for Obama. And that's on national security. Because Obama can say, I killed Bin Laden. Now they say, look, your policy is a disaster. Look, the Muslims are up and on. They're burning our embassies. What kind of success have you had? When you went to Cairo and you reached out to them with the open hand and they're responding with an iron fist. We need someone in the White House who can, should, who can undertake the proper policy in the Muslim world. That's, a, that's one aspect of it. And to do that, to rile up the Muslims, <coughs> say, see, that's what you're dealing with. Another aspect is to keep a climate of tension between the Muslim world and the Western world that will support this ongoing war that has been launched, the endless war, the war on terror that has no end because it has no geographical boundary. It has no well-defined strategic objectives. It's against some amorphous, ill-defined concept. And the only way to keep it going is to say, you see, we're dealing with a bunch of terrorists. It's the nature of their religion. This is psychological warfare. And another aspect of that psychological warfare is to beat down the Muslims. And to make the Muslims doubt the integrity of their religion. And it's working. You see Muslims in this country, in massive depression. Here we go again. How can I go to work today? Every time you turn on the television, it's another crisis. That's how they want you to think. And that's why we say unplug, disconnect, and get into your Quran. Read the seer of your Prophet. Learn about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Read the history. Not only the history of the Muslims, the history of others. So you can see the impact of Islam on the global stage. And the final greatness of Islamic civilization, no other civilization was able to do this. Including today's Western civilization. It has managed to establish its hegemony, but it hasn't managed to assimilate the best qualities of the people it's crushing. So you see people all over the world wearing blue jeans. All of the world, if they're not eating at Kentucky Fried Chicken, they wish they could. Even in Mecca. All of the world. You see, Western cultural norms imposed on people. The genius of Islamic civilization 
It was able to take the best from the previous civilization, the best from the Greeks, the best from the Romans, the best from the Persians, the best from the Indians, the best from the Chinese, the best from the Asians, and melt it all into one harmonious integrated unit that respected cultural diversity. So everyone, even those people, Arab Spring, what do they wear? They're wearing blue jeans and t-shirts, by and large. But when Islam spread, people in Malaysia and Indonesia don't dress like people in Africa. Africa they have the grand boo-boo. People in Kurdistan don't dress like people in Bangladesh. People in Bangladesh, current to present day Bangladesh, don't dress like people in Muslim Spain. When Islam was there, how they dress. Their foods are different. There's no equivalent of the Big Mac in Islamic civilization. They all have their unique foods, their unique cultures. This is Islam, brothers and sisters. This.